Muy buenos días. Good morning. Bienvenidos al and welcome del to the launch of the Women Americas. Growing Together in the Americas program in the framework BID, of the IDP's annual meeting and Invito IDP Invest. I invite Reina, Reina Irene Mejía Chacón, Irene Mejía Chacón the Executive Vice President at the Inter-American Development Bank, to give Adelante, a few opening Presidenta. remarks. Go ahead, Madam Vice President. I'd like to start by welcoming all of our government officials and private sector representatives who are involved in this workshop. And I would like to give a special thank you to Marta Lucia Ramirez, the Vice President of Colombia, and our distinguished panelists who are with us today. Investing in women is investing in society. Throughout my career, I have seen the transformational effect of closing gaps that disproportionately affect business women, and I have witnessed the power of the network of mutual support. When I previously worked at Citibank, it was my privilege to integrate and promote the creation of mentorship, mentoring programs, and create networks of contacts for women's, women in Latin America and Asia. It is an honor for me to be here with you today and to offer up a few initial reflections for this meeting, which will touch on a topic that is a strategic priority for the bank and extremely dear to me, strengthening micro, small, and medium-sized businesses, MSMEs, that are women-led or women-owned. This represents the intersection of three priority areas for the bank for economic recovery and job creation in the region. One, Econom the economic dos, empowerment of women, two, digitization, and finally, integrating women in value Latina chains. Caribe, in Latin America and the Caribbean, there are over 27 million MSMEs. Of these, 95% are micro businesses, and they generate 61% of jobs. MSMEs are the engine of the economy in our region, and these make up 99% of all total businesses. We know that the effects of the pandemic have been devastating. In 2020, our region saw a slowdown to the tune of 7 7.4 percent of the GDP. The COVID-19 Work Observatory of the IDB Group shows a loss of at least 30 million jobs. And ECLAC calculates that the percentage of MSMEs that are in danger of closing could be over 20 percent. The outlook for MSMEs that are managed by women is even more complex. Their involvement in global value chains is limited their level of use and adopting information and communication technology is low. They, it is more possible that their businesses will close and their access to financing is insufficient. The financing gap in our region actually is over $91 billion which is the highest in the world. Today is a part of the IDB Group's commitment to growth and making women-owned or women-led MSMEs visible. I am pleased to announce the launch of the Women Growing Together in the Americas program in order to help these businesses continue to be the engines of economic recovery and to create jobs in Latin America and the Caribbean. This program will provide technical assistance that is focused, first of all, on strengthening capacities and improving production in order to make it easier for these businesses to become a part of foreign trade and value chains when it comes to the use and adoption of technologies for transformation and for optimizing business processes. And it will focus on improving financial management of businesses in order to facilitate access to financing. Additionally, this program will provide mentorship by experts in these issues. Uh, 
iniciativa del sector de integración y comercio del BID, que hoy cuenta con más de 125 mil empresarios pudiendo así lograr un efecto multiplicador en toda la región. Este programa, además, complementa otras iniciativas de la región de apoyo de los empresarios lideradas por los lados de los lados de los lados. IDB Lab, the social sector, and IDB Invest, our private branch. And as the name would indicate, growing together in the Americas means that we need a collective effort. That is why I would like to sincerely thank the partners of our program who are with us today, helping business women grow their businesses and help grow their communities and economies via job creation. Finally, though, I would like to thank all of you, business women. I would like to thank you for your strength and your tenacity. This program is for and by all of you. I invite you to make the most of it. Go to connectamericas.com women. Before concluding, I would like to introduce Grace Mesa, who is an Ecuadorian businesswoman in the flower production, production sector and an example of resilience. We dream that our children will be better than us. For me, it's more important that they thrive. My name is Grace. I live in Quito and I commute to the farm every day. I work in floriculture and flower exports. The biggest rose crops are in Tabacundo. They say that Tabacundo is the rose capital of the world. This is a family-owned business. We set out to put this project together, and that part took, of course, a long time. It took about seven years. It was very difficult. There were 14 of us, now we are 35 people. We went from exporting one box to two boxes to three boxes and we grew little by little. Now we are in the United States, in Spain, France, Germany, Italy, Russia, China, Kazakhstan, and we want to continue growing. The pandemic is a problem. One day we were told, well, tomorrow curfew begins and you all need to lock down. We were trying to make ends meet, but there comes a time when you become desperate and you don't know what to do. But I think it's important to remember that we never, never fired anyone. We had some savings from the previous Valentine's Day, which is when most people buy flowers. Before the pandemic, we already had an e-commerce pro project to export directly to the end consumer and to own a website and many other things. More important things were afoot, though. But first, we had to cover the salaries of the people who work here. But we kept on moving forward and hoping we would start selling through the web page and through these e-commerce tools and more. Of course, we looked for financing, which was a terrible process and our savings were no longer enough to cover anything. One of the main barriers is being a woman, because I believe it's very complicated for a woman to get financing. There are people who discriminate a lot against women. They don't take me as seriously as they do my husband. Here, the person managing this is me. I try to make sure the majority of collaborators I hire are women. So in my view, the only way to have more women entrepreneurs and more women business owners is for women to empower ourselves and thrive. For me, the greatest outcome of this, the most beautiful thing about exporting, is knowing that I am helping 35 families because we provide jobs for entire families. I want my children to have that vision. I want the people who work here with me to grow with me, and I want for all of us to grow together.
Good morning, and thank you, everyone, for being here with us. Today we are launching Women Growing Together in the Americas, a program to strengthen women's economic empowerment, developing MSMEs, and making the most of new opportunities that have come from the reconfiguration of global value chains. As Reina explained to us, the challenges we face can only be overcome if we work together with key stakeholders in the public and the private sector. Today, I have great allies of this program with whom we will chat about what the agenda will look like. It is as ambitious as it is hopeful. Before we get started, let's look at the context of women entrepreneurs in Latin America and the Caribbean, and let's see what the main barriers, that barriers they face are. We analyzed over 1,000 1, Connect America's businesses at the IDB, and we saw the following data. Of the data we saw, women-led businesses are left behind when it comes to participating in the value chain. For example, only 28% are involved in global value chains compared to 380% of their male counterparts. Additionally, 61% of these entrepreneurs have not brought in communication and information technology in order to optimize their production processes. Uh, the main obstacles we saw was the lack of financial resources and technical expertise. 76% of women-led or women-owned MSMEs that were analyzed reported that they needed financing during the pandemic, but they were unable to obtain it. 34% of female businesswomen attribute this to the lack of financial advice and a lack of financing, and 34 attributed to a lack of capacity as far as taking on debt in their businesses. As you see, the outlook shows great challenges and opportunities so that we may position our women entrepreneurs as key actors in the economic recovery of our countries. This is why we have called together experts in the public and private sector to be with us today to explore how we may work together on these ambitious challenges. Let's move on to questions then, and this will be the first round. Today, we have Heidi Gallo Santos, the Presidential Advisor for Women's Equity of Colombia. I would like to welcome Heidi Gallo Santos, who leads the Women's Empowerment Strategy for Colombia as the President's Advisor for Women's Equality. Hey, the Colombia is positioning itself as a leading country in the region when it comes to designing public policies to promote women entrepreneurship in Colombia and to position them as an important part of economic recovery. For example, the entrepreneurship law that was recently passed creates a fund for women that will look at women's involvement in public acquisitions in the country. Haiti, could you talk to us more about initi initiatives of the Colombian government to promote entrepreneurial growth for women and how you are helping women-led businesses and including them in your export strategies? Yes, of course, thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here at the annual Board of Governors meeting and to be here on this panel representing Ivan Duque's administration on behalf of our vice President, as you s mentioned, it's very exciting to me to be a part of this administration, which has taken on the cause of women as a transformational aspect that has come to stay here during this administration as a legacy to Colombia's so Colombian society. But one topic you've talked about and that we heard about before is that we have positioned the message of the star role that women must have as an engine for greater growth and specifically as accelerators for economic recovery. That is why our women's equality policy, which has been implemented since day one of this administration, has at, at its core more economic empowerment for women to create more economic opportunities for them. And we are in a situation where we know that COVID has affected women and it has affected women, economically speaking, to a greater extent. We have a strategy called Colombia is Recovering with Women. What's the main objective of the strategy? To consolidate that legacy, to turn Colombia into a country of women entrepreneurs. What is the goal set forth by Marta Lucia Ramirez, our vice president, who leads this strategy, that at the end of this administration, we will have worked with at least one million women entrepreneurs, rural and urban 
women. So how are we doing this? It's a pleasure for me then to be a part of this panel for Women Growing Together in the Americas because this is a perfect match as far as the implementation of the, this initiative. Colombia's strategy, Colombian recovery with women, has several pillars. One is where, thanks to the measures adopted by this administration, such as subsidizing jobs, among others, we have closed some poverty gaps and we have maintained formal jobs in our country. But you were saying something very interesting before, how Colombia is consolidating itself as a leader in the region when it comes to implementing entrepreneurial initiatives f focused on women. We truly believe in this policy, and our government policy that we will introduce has become a state policy, thanks to the fact that during the last half of the year, our Congress was, uh, this was passed by women. First, with the entrepreneurship law, we identified the gaps that the IDB has stated, a lack of technical assistance to structure projects that are market-oriented. Definitely, there's a gap when it comes to accessing financing. So we created the Fund for Women Entrepreneurs, a fund that is focused solely on being a channel for financing and highlighting women-led initiatives to offer financial goods and services to women, that we hope that this is a vehicle to invest in capital, invest capital in women-led businesses. So with this fund, we want these initiatives, these businesses to be scalable, to be profitable, and that they will last over time. One initiative is the access to public uh, procurement on the market. 14 per, that's 14 percent of the GDP, and with this new law, we stated that all entities that have public resources in Colombia must have differentiated criteria with some additional points to guarantee that women-led businesses will benefit from this important part of the economy. And we also went out to regions, uh, resources from royalties and mining we established as well in the law that when regional leaders structure projects that are financed by these royalty-based projects, there must be a gender focus. And we are working with the National Planning Department in Colombia on structuring several projects so that these projects structured by regional leaders favor especially women-led initiatives and businesses in the region for economic recovery coming from regions in Colombia. This is a package of measures that is already underway, and it's being added to instructions given by the President of the Republic through a presidential decree in our strategy, the commitment for Colombia. The main focus is to create jobs and reactivate the economy. The President tells all entities of the national government that these specific projects must include at least three criteria. First, to maintain women's employment, to make employment of women more dynamic in sectors that in Colombia and worldwide have been dominated by males, for example, uh, mining, housing, energy. And with this presidential decree, we have certain resources from this year's budget. And next, our goal is to create 800,000 opportunities to work with women and help them obtain jobs or become entrepreneurs. I'd like to highlight of this presidential decree one thing that Irene said, and that is that it's important that we have more and more women in the technology sector in a Pro program led by our IT minister. So we are working hand in hand with her so that a high number of these programmers, for example, encoders, are women. With these two tools, then, we are helping regions. We are working with the 32 departments in the country so that these measures that we have adopted in our national government may reach our 32 departments and so that Colombia is able to recover with the help of women. And Jessica, this is the package of measures where we reaffirm our commitment to have a government policy that becomes a state policy. And we were sure that there will be knowing there will be no going back. And as the IDB says, this we're becoming a pioneering country, a leading country in the region to ensure more opportunities and greater welfare for a greater part of the population of our country. 
Thank you, Gady. Very interesting. And listening to you, that reminds me of how we are so aligned with this issue at the IDB. Women and gender for us is a priority because women are the engine of economic recovery in the region. We firmly believe in that, which is why we are going to work um, together with you, and it is an honor to share this space with you. Now, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Alejandra Ferraro from Accenture. They have uh, been supporting the methodological design of Creciendo Juntas, growing together. Alejandra, we'll continue with you. The companies that have survived or even grown during the pandemic share something in common, which is the digitalization. The premise here is the more digital you are, the more adaptable you are. Accenture has implemented methodologies to support digital processes in a variety of industries of, in companies of different sizes. What are the most pressing needs for MSMEs in terms of the digital transformation, and what role has Accenture played in that? Um, good morning. Uh, it's, um, I'm, I'm very... Uh, Happy to be here at this uh, launch. I'm here to represent Accenture Development Partners to your question on the digital transformation. It's very important to have a clear strategy. Second, supporting that, that strategy of transformation, the, the digital transformation uh, means you need to commit time and resources. There's also a core component here, which is inspiration to change the mindset. What does that mean? It means mm, understanding where we want to go, to be willing to explore new trends, and to build the, that transformation, leveraging digital and tech uh, in that transformation. Second element you need is to build a roadmap that will include the changes in processes, in technology, in staff, all of that related to changes such as rethinking your clients and your business models. That whole component is very important in order to uh, understand the differences in the road to be traveled. The third component is follow-up. Once you select that uh, roadmap that you will follow, it is important to follow up on implementing each one of these steps. At Accenture Development Partnership, we have a lot of experience with a variety of organizations uh, working with entrepreneurs on this journey to understand their needs, uh, customizing uh, their needs for co-creation, start and understanding the starting point, which then serves in order to identify that journey of implementation of the lessons that are needed in order to achieve implementation. So I'm very happy to be here, very happy uh, to support the women entrepreneurs in these digital transformations in their businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much for those very interesting comments. Now, we have uh, Susan Siegel, a great uh, partner for our bank. She has been working through in Latin America in the financial sector, now from the Council of the Americas, promoting an important Thank you for joining us today. In, the Americas. in your career, you have always created spaces to mentor and support women entrepreneurs, particularly in Latin America. How do we ensure that the small and medium enterprises led by women have access to financing? Where are the obstacles and where are the opportunities? Thank you very much, Jessica. And thank you. Muchas gracias al IDB por organizar este panel. Thank you to the IDB for putting together this uh, panel, for letting me take part in this uh, launch. Because um, <laughs> you asked me the question in English. Um, the, uh, the IFC has estimated that worldwide there is a $300 billion gap in financing which exists 
uh, for formal women-owned small businesses, and more than 70% of women-owned small and medium-sized enterprises have inadequate or no access to financial services. So when you ask about the opportunity, that's the opportunity um, from my perspective when there's such a deficit. Um, so when we talk about financing, it's still very hard to lump, in my opinion, all these categories together um, because each one's diff different. There's a deficit of financing in every single one of them. In micro, we have to make sure in micro businesses that women are financially literate, and we can do that through fintech and education promotion. In small and medium-sized enterprises, there is debt and equity financing, and there's none of either or very little of either. So there are many challenges for both men and women, um, and we need to come up with structures that work and that um, can go all the way from working with women on how to structure a loan to explaining why selling equity in their businesses doesn't mean giving up control of their businesses. Um, so how can we do that? Well, first, the financial community, and that's men and women, have to be made aware of the deficit of financing for women because you can't fix something that people don't think exists. And still, there are plenty of people that don't understand that. Um, you also need pools of money to make equity investments in small and medium-sized companies. Micro banks, you might need transitory allocation of funds for women's businesses to make sure they get a piece of the financing. But most importantly, women need to be mentored and supported. And mentored means um, education. It means um, working with women on how to ask for financing and why it's important to get financing. We need to help train um, by providing business skills and, and, and work. It's not just mentoring, but it's also providing the opportunity for women to come together um, and learn about what it means to financing. Because many women in small that manage small and medium-sized businesses don't have what you, you and I would consider to be the traditional financial skills. And it's our responsibility to help these women learn those skills. And I also think that financial institutions could use um, alternative methods, for example, to do some credit checks on people um, because they don't, a lot of these women owned businesses don't have a track record of credit, right? A lot of times you need credit to get credit. So we need to look instead at cash flow or a track record of enterprise performance, or a track record of women actually paying their suppliers to come up with our own ability to track and rate these. So I think the IDB plays a huge role in a number of ways, in providing educational forums, in working with the private sector to provide those educational forums, but also in providing pools of money for women. Um, and, um, take the lead in structuring these pools so that they can um, support women's own businesses in unique structures and unique um, ideas. And I look forward to uh, helping build some of those ideas out. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much. And I just, before we get to our next panelist, I just wanted to reiterate the point that you raised, which gets to the idea of formalization, because there's a lot of women in the region who, quite frankly, are outside of the system because they are not part of the formal employment networks. And so that is something that we, we have to work on and we have to address. And I know that's something that Colombia has been working on in many other countries in the region. So I just wanted to say that that is also something that we at the bank feel is incredibly important to discuss and to bring about because the whole idea of empowering women is, is financing its access to credit. It's exactly what you said, the track record, but it's also that whole ecosystem of development that could affect women who are the, the, great, the great movers of economies in the region. And if you're outside the formal system, you can't get credit. Exactly. That's exactly right. Well, we are also thrilled to welcome JP Suarez from Walmart. 
who have a track record of supporting women's inclusion in supply chains and are committed to working with us to identify partnership opportunities to make women growing together in the Americas a success. We think it is key to stress the importance of male allies in this inclusion work. So we're thankful to JP and to Walmart for a real track record in that regard as well. And obviously we know that Walmart has amazing women in its leadership, so I wanted to applaud your efforts in that. The Women's Economic Empowerment Summit was organized to celebrate and having reached ahead of time Walmart's five-year goal of sourcing 20 billion from women suppliers. Since then, you've continued to expand your capacity to integrate women entrepreneurs into domestic Western hemisphere and global value chains. What lessons for women growing together in the Americas has Walmart's experience with this commitment uncovered? Thank you very much, Jessica, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's a great panel, and uh, thank you for letting me uh, uh, not use my rusty Spanish right now because the pandemic has affected a lot of things, including, you know, my language. But so thank you. Um, <clears throat> look. We are um, we're deeply committed to this uh, and we're aligned with the goal of the IDB program and we're continuing to look for opportunities that we can work together. Um, just to, before I even start, I just tell you as a funny story is um, when when the IDB re first reached out to me, um, I had a conflict this morning because I was supposed to be speaking to a group of women high potential leaders in our business. And I swapped that out to come here because I thought this was a priority that we also needed to talk about. So we're committed, as you said, we, are, we and I am an ally and it's super important. And I, I love the way you framed the discussion because we have, we, we have start with the government support and we need to have government support and initiatives that support women's economic growth and development and opportunities. And then we have to make sure that we have support from organizations like the Inter-American Bank, uh, Development Bank. And then we have to have the digitization and the access to finance and the mentoring. And then we have to have routes to market. And that's where Walmart comes in and companies like Walmart can help. And um, you said we, we, you know, as you noticed or as you noted, um, we had a goal of 20 billion, and I'm proud to say that we've already sur sourced more than 34 billion dollars from women-owned businesses in the last eight years. You know, if you think about it, that's as big as some of our competitors like Michaels or True Value or Neiman Marcus or Chipotle. All of that just from women-owned businesses and entrepreneurs. And we're going to continue to invest in programs. You know, we supported the Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative for Guatemala with USAID. Um, and we're helping those small and micro entrepreneurs build the foundation that they need in order to be successful in everything from, you know, getting support for how to run your business to how to get permits and how to get through some of the local regulatory processes. And maybe, Jessica, we can come back to that about how important that is as we think about how do you help women-owned businesses get through to being able to operate with all the licenses and permits. Um, but, you know, one of the dangers is $34 billion is a really big number, and sometimes it's hard to really reduce that to what does that really mean? And so let me give you just a couple of examples of how we're helping women entrepreneurs, and then um, I can give you some lessons learned. But, you know, it starts with helping people and helping women develop their businesses. And I point to a company called Southwind, which is a woman-owned supplier um, founded 25 years ago by a woman by the name of Valeria Auda. She works in Chile, and she was, uh, she, she was an entrepreneur helping develop seafood products for our market in Chile. And um, we had a chat with Valeria, and she just says, you know, look, it's, entrepreneurship is hard. It starts slow, and it takes a lot of investment. But after, uh, after a, a bit of time, we were able to get a contract with her. She's now producing private label for our business in Chile for export, and what's most important is she now has 170 employees working for her, and almost all of them are women that she, that she employs in the market helping to grow their business. In 2018, Southwind was the Chile Supplier of the Year. Just tells you the impact that she's having um, as, she, as she developed this business. There's an example that we have um, by a company called Acacia in Chile, a woman by the name of Catalina Espinosa. We put out an open call and asked for companies to help us get smarter in our supply chain and how to use AI to help us route our trucks and our fleet better. And Catalina and her small company developed an algorithm that we are now deploying in all of our DCs um, in Chile because we are able to be much more efficient with the help of entrepreneurs like Catalina. And then my, the last one I love is uh, a woman by the name of Andreina Sade. And she, uh, she, she started a company called Green Soup when she was pregnant and she was cooking and making great soups for family and friends. And they told her, why don't you go ahead and make a business of that? 
And so she started, and, she, and with the support from one of our programs in Chile, um, we were able to give her some training and assistance. And uh, today she's selling their product in in Chile. She's got a great business. She's growing about 61% a year. And uh, she was uh, recently asked by the Chilean government to be the program manager of a women's empowerment program that's funded by, you guessed it, the IDB. So this is all integrated. It all comes together. You know, working together, we can, we can really make a difference. Um, there's a couple of points that I would make. The first one is you have to be proactive and affirmative about this. This isn't gonna, this isn't just gonna happen. We have to be very intentional about taking steps and helping. And if you do that, a lot can happen. I also think the idea of opening up the opportunities. Um, don't go to the same suppliers or businesses or companies that you always go to, but try an open call, try open ways and, and opening up the, the, the opportunities for new companies that you may be unfamiliar with to come in and, and learn and get them uh, connected to you. The other thing that I notice is that brands and local matter. So let's look for local opportunities that may not be the biggest brands, but in fact, local matters. Green Soup is a local brand that we were able to help develop and grow because we reached into there. We didn't just go to the big companies, which are important, but we have to get sure we have to get the right balance. And then as the panelists mentioned before, um, we need to help develop digital skills, digital training, and on the job training and support. So I think there's a lot that we can do to Together and every part of the um, uh, of the economy has a role, from government to private sector to public sector. And I think if we do it well, I think we'll look back in five years from now, and 20 billion will seem like a very modest goal. Absolutely. And thank you so much for for sharing everything that you've been doing from Walmart and from the private sector. I, I will just wanted to add one more point before we go to our next panelist. I think that the role of the private sector is going to be huge in the coming year in terms of recovery after the pandemic. I think that there's a lot of creativity and innovation that combined with a lot of the creativity and innovation that I've heard, even in my short time at the IDB from the public sector, I think will be very important um, to combine forces. I think that could be very powerful. And we at the IDB are very much looking forward to to being a, a broker of, of the, that cooperation and collaboration um, in the coming years. So thank you, JP. Now, uh, por último, pero no por eso menos importante, le damos la bienvenida Last, a Kiki del Valle de Mastercard. But not least, we'd like to welcome Kiki del Valle from Mastercard, who will contribute with her experience as a digital payment facilitator. Providing support for the initiative. We know that MasterCard has consolidated partnerships with a variety of agencies to offer products that facilitate digitalization, e-payments for MSMEs. Can you tell us uh, some of the uh, lessons you've drawn from that experience? How can we make the most of that in a program like Growing Together in the Americas? Thank you um, very much. It's a pleasure and honor to be part of this event. First of all, COVID pushed uh, millions of consumers to, toward new forms of payment and uh, new types of banking. In fact, the digital transition in Latin America it has grown three times more than the global average. However, millions of people are invisible to the financial system today with no access to goods, services, to the ability to increase their income or improve their lives. MasterCard works with all of our partners to raise the profile of digital financial services that are being developed in the region. For example, we saw very quick uh, distribution of uh, social support funds this year, which have offered a path to offer safe financial services at scale for the disadvantaged. We also saw this last year, unfortunately, the loss of 30 million jobs in Latin America, women experiencing an even bigger loss of jobs compared to men. And that is where the problem lies for us. I believe all companies here are focused on an inclusive economic recovery and on achieving a sustainable recovery in Latin America. We believe that this needs to uh, bear three things in mind. First, to strengthen cultural projects with MSMEs. Second, offering access to finance to those people, and third, creating networks that serve to open doors to clients, investors, 
to achieve the scale that we need. MasterCard has developed several programs, products, uh, partnerships, uh, new business models. Uh, we've also developed uh, some financial education programs. I can give you some examples for MSMEs. Their digital health is a priority, not just during the pandemic, during the crisis, but also it is critical for their future. So we work with fintechs, banks, and governments on a daily basis with credit programs, prepayment programs for different um, communities. At the beginning of the pandemic, we launched our digital acceleration platform. The purpose of that is to help in the economic recovery and to digitally develop many businesses. MSMEs then can uh, get, get um, best practices from it to expand, to grow online, and to protect themselves from cyber attacks. We also work very hard on financial education. It's another one of our target areas. We have a partnership with INCAE and with IDB to launch Leads Mujeres. It is a virtual course, completely free, and it helps um, business people develop strategies to grow their businesses. This is um, uh, courses. These are courses on sales, marketing, um, financing, financial alternatives to a fund growth and to end, I'll give you an example from a month ago in Colombia, we launched uh, an empowerment program, StarPath, uh, working with the U.S. government. It's our virtual accelerator at MasterCard for businesses. It uh, seeks to work in Colombia to make the most of our resources to expand the reach of businesses, MSMEs in Colombia. These are uh, women uh, founded um, MSMEs. It's a two year program to provide high level mentorship, mentoring to allow women entrepreneurs to get access to capital where we share our network of partners, which will open doors to investors and potential clients for all of these women business, business women led businesses. We have more than 800 women entrepreneurs that have uh, shown interest in this program already. That shows you how much interest there is in, in this segment and the need for programs programs like this, like growing together to, in order to grow a businesses. But above all, we're looking at how do we work to make this methodology um, expandable to all countries, working with the IDB to make sure that it's replicable, that it's uh, measurable, that it's scalable, and that would then um, serve to expand this and to have impact for women throughout Latin America. So it's programs like this, our knowledge, it's all available for uh, your initiative, Creciendo Juntas, Growing Together, and we are very excited to uh, uh, looking forward to working together with you. Thank you, Kiki, thank you for your comments. The work that you're doing uh, MasterCard is very interesting. Thank you very much. Now uh, we're going uh, back to Gady with the following question. Katie, what are the uh, actions that IDB and, and other multilateral banks uh, should look to, toward in order to support women-led businesses and to bring them into international value chains? Thank you for your question, Jessica. I'd like to begin by saying our Vice President um, has been a believer that uh, there are three pillars to the economic recovery. First, working jointly with the business community. Second, making the most of our ability to include the informal segment of the population. Jessica, you made a very interesting comment, an important comment rather, when uh, Susan spoke, and that is how Latin America has a huge problem with the informal sector, where unfortunately women are the most seriously affected affected by that. And then third, we need to make, make the most of that potential to transform that women have as the engine of economic recovery and growth. So the question is, in order to consolidate uh, Colombia as a nation of uh, women entrepreneurs, how do we do that? First question is to look at where we are now. And by the way, I want to thank the IDB for some very good research that they've done on women entrepreneurs in the uh, Pacific Alliance countries. What we've seen in Colombia is in the ecosystem here, business ecosystem, 92% of women-led businesses are micro-enterprises. And that tells you uh, how we are working now. Another part of that study identified Colombia as third ranked in Latin America, being the country with the most women that are in the fintech sector. In other words, we have uh, the two uh, extremes in entrepreneurship. We need to look at what are the gaps 
uh, that we have first um, so that women can scale up their businesses, have more profitable businesses, more sustainable businesses. And then we need to look at how these fintech entrepreneurs, how we can have much, many more women uh, leading these high impact um, enterprises in the fourth the industrial revolution, making the most of the digital economy. We have basically identified two uh, barriers here, and that's where your question uh, fits in, Jessica. The IDB and multilateral banks' role in order to make uh, this potential reality. First, how do we close the financial gap? And Grace's uh, comments on Ecuador, I think that rings true for millions of women in Latin America and Colombia. How do we get access to financial resources? That's one of uh, the barriers. And I want to quickly talk about what we're doing in, in Colombia. First, our Mujer Emprende Fund, it's public policy that is focused on closing that gap. I also want to thank the IDB because you have been critical in structuring and in the execution of that fund. I also want to talk about what's happening in the private sector. We have been working internationally. We have 17 different uh, bonds issued with a gender focus. In Latin America, there are about six bond issuances. Colombian banks have issued three of these bonds two of them with IDB support. And I want to highlight that as a good practice, very good experience because it serves to channel more resources into the economy in support of, the, of those enterprises. And we, in the Vice President's office and in our special um, council, have been working with those banks in order to uh, reach out to women entrepreneurs. Secondly, when it comes to the financial system, we're part of an international uh, uh, effort led by the uh, UN, where Colombia was selected as a pioneering country in order to structure an a gender equity sovereign bond. bond. We're working uh, on that with the Ministry of Finance. The third comment to address your question specifically, Jessica, what can multilateral banks do? What can the IDB do? And here, I would like to submit to your consideration our Vice President's proposal, which is that within the framework of this uh, yearly conference, a mechanism to support fresh resources to support women entrepreneurs should be considered, where a percentage of IDB loans would be targeted to promote government of policy for that purpose through government allocations. That's the first issue on, on, on closing that financial gap. Second, another very important issue, closing the digital gap for women. Here, uh, I would mention that in 2019, the World Economic Forum carried out an in-depth analysis of 150 countries in the world looking at um, gender gaps, and there was a very striking question there having to do with how much time would it take to close the economic gap between men and women. This was in December of 2019. The responses were overwhelming. 150 years, approximately. That is, we're still waiting for a response uh, to that after COVID from the World Economic Forum. But what I would say is that it is one of the more difficult gaps that women have to face. It's technology, uh, ownership of technology, which is a critical tool to promote entrepreneurship. And this, Jessica, I'd like to raise this here because you've been uh, leading a series of studies at the IDB on the future of work in Latin America. There's a special chapter in there on women where you discuss how this gap needs to be closed uh, through public policy and through a business action because it is critical when it comes to bringing in women into the economy. And it's in this second concept where I believe multilateral banks banks and the IDB can play a strategic role to help close that gap. Colombia has a very uh, robust uh, policy where the Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation, the Minister of Education and the Ministry uh, of uh, IT is in creating incentives for uh, young women and teens to uh, opt into the STEM uh, professions. But we need to have uh, a lot more impact on women that are already on 
entrepreneurs that are already in business. And I say this because it is so important in our strategy to position women as the uh, main uh, players in, in growth. We saw how the economy of, of uh, care uh, is very important for women. It's also very important for the economic growth. And Jessica, I can tell you that we're working with the vice president on a pilot um, project where we're looking at um, business demand um, making, and helping uh, them set up telework so that we can hire women that can be at, remain at home while having uh, economic opportunity through technology, through the digital sphere. And undoubtedly, Jessica, I'll, I'll end with this, all of these proposals uh, have significant uh, support. Uh, it's based on the strategy that we are launching today to close the financial gap, to close the digital gap. And I reiterate, it's very important that we consider the vice president's proposal to uh, allocate a percentage of uh, multilateral bank uh, loans to close the gender gap to create more opportunity for women. Thank you, Haley, for all of the ideas you've presented. I think this shows that there's a lot of work for all of us to do in the future, in the coming months. And obviously, to highlight one point, I would say I do think it's very important to figure out how to close gaps with the IDB, not only the public sector, but IDB Lab and IDB Invest to work as a team to figure out how to make progress in this mission. We want to support not only governments with technical assistance, financing, but we also want to look at the private sector side because this is a joint task and it will take time and resources and we were very much much committed to taking on this work and working with governments such as the government of Colombia and others in the region so that this actually happens. Another question, Alejandra, what do you think the necessary elements are for a program like Women Growing Together? What does it need to consider? What was it that led you to join as partners in this effort? Well, first of all, I've been motivated by hearing everyone's words. What Haiti said, I completely agree with, as well as all of our panelists. We are motivated by the desire to want to harness the talent of women entrepreneurs. There's so much of it in all markets, and we want to make the most of it. We want women to close the digital gap so that we can strengthen and create new abilities, but we also want for women to have a digital transformation in their businesses. There needs to be a change of mindset and their network is a critical factor when it comes to women entrepreneurs in communities with stakeholders in general and other partners. I think we have a fundamental role to play there. In the private sector, we need to think that this it's not just a matter of counsel, transformation, and mentoring. These are all things that we already do in our businesses, or at least we do at Accenture. But really, we need to transform integration in our value chains. We need to integrate women. We need to give women entrepreneurs a chance. And even micro in enterprises need to be a part of it. And I want to highlight social micro enterprises in Latin America. There's a percentage, a large percentage of entrepreneurs who are vulnerable, who are in small communities. And we at large companies are a very powerful channel. We can help these businesses open the door. We can help close that gap. We can give them a first opportunity so that we can add what's lacking, empowerment, working in the financial sector, help businesses get the papers they need in order to interact with us. And we need to break down these barriers so that integration can happen. So we do have a very important role to play here. This initiative is fabulous, and it's fabulous because it considers women and specific needs in the region. Thank you very much, Alejandra.
Go on, Susan. We will move on to Susan. The Council of the Americas created the Women's Hemispheric Network, which is about to celebrate its first decade. Can you tell us about the achievements and lessons learned that we should take into account for women growing together in the Americas? Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, as background, um, this is what inspired us. Women make up less than 20% of the global board of directors and serve as CEOs um, as less than 6%. Um, and that isn't growing so much. And in Latin America, it's even dire. So we started it with those statistics in mind. And the idea is, is that we're trying to work with women between 21 and say 40 um, and encourage them to stay in the workforce and advance uh, to leadership positions. Um, so we host a number of activities. We provide, many of you have talked about networking opportunities, um, and those networking opportunities actually turn into mentoring opportunities where women can share their experiences. Role models are critical. And one of the things that we've noticed um, is that most women don't have networks. So we help provide networks. Um, most women um, are afraid to be bold in their thoughts, process and aspirations and their demands. And we help with that. Um, women don't see themselves as having many of the same issues that other women have. So when you share experiences, that can often cause women um, to feel more comfortable um, confronting issues. Um, so we're providing that space and it's really important. And in Latin America, we need to feel that we need to make women feel comfortable that they can do it all. Because in some ways, women in Latin America culturally and in the United States too, aren't comfortable with that idea. And so we've also learned the importance of public and private sector cooperation in advancing the agenda. And one of the things we've also stressed to these women is it's not just about women, it's about men too, because you need to cultivate and get men to mentor you to move along. So each Latin American country is a little bit different, but at the end of the day, um, we think that there's a lot you can do when you create role models, networks, and a support mechanism to make people, to make women feel included and bold. Thanks, Susan. And before we go back to JP uh, with the next question, I just wanted to add a little bit on that if I could just take a moment. I've been truly inspired by this whole conversation in part because at the IDB, obviously the president um, truly believes that this is an issue of, of major importance in the region and for the recovery post pandemic. But I will say that at the IDB, part of the philosophy that we're trying to promote is if you're going to talk the talk, you have to walk the walk. So women in leadership, women leading from where they are, this is part of a conversation that we've actually begun within the IDB. It's a conversation that uh, I personally have tried to promote with our EVP Reina Irene Mejia, who you just saw at the start of this event. Um, between the two of us and, and our colleagues at the IDB, we're trying to actually do exactly that, Susan provide the mentoring, expand that network, expand that knowledge so that women don't feel like they don't have opportunities so that there's a lot more of an open conversation, not just of the positive things that the IDB is doing to make um, create opportunities for women to advance uh, within our own institution, but how we can be models also for the region. Because for us to be able to promote the inclusion of women, for us to be able to promote the financing of small and medium-sized enterprises, for us to promote any of this, we have to walk the walk and talk the talk. And so I'm very proud of the work that our executive team is doing. And I will say that the role of male allies can never be underestimated, um, ever, ever. Um, uh, Mauricio is one of the greatest advocates that the, that the bank has. And he is right there standing side by side with James Scriven and Richard Martinez, our vice president for countries, Benigno Lopez, our vice president for sectors, Gustavo de Rosa, our vice, vice, vice president for finance. I mean, I think we are truly blessed that working with Irene Hoffman at IDB Lab, we have an entire executive team that believes in this cause, in this issue and in this development goal. And so I just wanted to just thank take, you. use this opportunity to say what we're doing at the IDB so that you know that this is a, is a commitment from the administration and from the bank to the issue. If I, if I may, Jessica, you know, this is my passion, but I also feel that after working for 40 years, it's my responsibility to help young women.
Correct. Absolutely. And I think um, being a, a woman myself from, you know, I was a, a first generation American with Colombian father and Ecuadorian mother who grew up in the complex um, double life of being all American, but having culture at home and a richness of language and tradition at home. I think I, I feel bestowed upon me personally uh, a responsibility to mentor and to guide women and young women in particular and also girls. I think the, the issue of girls at Haiti, I just wanted to say one more point. It starts with a girl and a dream. Absolutely. That's how you get women in leadership positions. And all you need is a girl and a dream and a support network. And that network can come from anywhere. And that is, is proven in my own story that you just need to have a dream and a way forward and a belief that you can chart the course and that those ahead of you are setting you up for success. And so I, I reiterate, thank you, Susan, for your comments and, and thank you to everyone. And now JP, without further ado, I wanted to get back to you on the issue of the digital economy. You had noted briefly that, the, that at Walmart, you had been working on digital economy and e-commerce. And I wanted to just get back to you to get your sense of your program of blending of digitally transformed stores, e-commerce, how that potential to boost the integration of women looks for you. How can you tell us how this would work for, for all of us? How can we learn lessons from this? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Jessica. And um, let me also just <clears throat> reiterate Susan's point. This is an, a responsibility for all of us. As a father of two daughters who are grown, um, I want them to have all the opportunities in the world to choose what they want to do, whether it's through entrepreneurship or academia, or uh, I have a daughter who's finishing up her journalism degree, to be able to be a writer um, and to find all the opportunities that are out there. It's all of our responsibility, and it's, it's beyond time that we start making real differences in the opportunities and access for women. And part of that is what my comment here is around that blending of digital and, um, <clears throat> and omni, what we call omni-channel commerce. I think why it's so important is because we can create digital tools that open up digital access ways and pathways for small and uh, <clears throat> micro entrepreneurs to start getting access to Walmart and the channels that we have. And then you have access to be able to start selling online or you can sell in our stores, depending on which is the better channel. And you and you can, and a, a, a woman owned business can get access a lot easier when we provide the digital tools and the digital access. You don't have to be a massive business in order to supply Walmart. You can be a seller on our marketplace or on our webpage, and you can get access to a very big market by connecting to us. Now, we have an obligation through using digital tools um, to help with things like seller services and seller insights. And we've, we can help, like we talked about in the previous um, discussion with providing tools and training and understanding about how to make sure that we fill the orders the right way and that we can meet the customer's demand. And there's a lot that we can do with digital tools to provide access. And you don't need to be a billion dollar business to be working with Walmart or others. You just need to be able to have the right tools and support and then we have to connect you to it. And I think if we do those, I think if we do those things, more and more women will enter into the business marketplace. More and more women will do like what we talked about with Green Soup, which is they're going to start trying and they're going to pursue their opportunities and they're going to get financing and they're going to get government support and they're going to have access to the opportunity that's so important. The digital the, 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 the digital integration, though, also needs to happen on the, you know, on the public sector side. And this is something that I think you know, Jessica, is very important to us at Walmart. It's this whole notion of making sure that the, the systems don't work against women and typically underrepresented people in the, in the business chain and the business cycle. It's too, it's too easy and it's too often that entrenched incumbents use regulatory systems to prevent other people from getting access and opportunity through permits, licensing, other things. And, you know, we're working with you in the American Business Dialogue about helping to strengthen digital tools that will allow people to have transparency in getting permits, getting licenses, getting access to the right to do business. And then partnering with businesses to provide them again, like I said, the, the pathway. And I think if we, we work together, as we've been talking a lot about it this morning, but if we work together across all the different 
channels that we have here represented. Um, and we digitize and make it easy and make it accessible and make it affordable for women and small um, and micro businesses to get access to the opportunity. I think that's what we have to do. And then quite honestly, then let us get out of the way and let it happen because it'll happen faster and better than we could even imagine. We've just got to make sure that those barriers that have prevented access and opportunity are put aside. And digital tools are going to help us with that support, you know, and uh, and investment and commitment is going to help us with that. But then let's get out of the way and let's watch it grow because it's going to grow fast. Thanks, JP. I appreciate those comments. Very important. What characteristics should financial products have so that they can better respond to the needs of women entrepreneurs? Thank you very much for the question. That's a very important one. When it comes to access of financing, it is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing currently, and COVID highlighted it, it highlighted the urgency and the need for women to transform their businesses. We were talking about going digital, for example, transforming these businesses overnight in order to survive. But why does this challenge exist? It can be chucked up to several different factors, but I'll mention just a few of them. First, how many competitors are in a market, for example, different offers of different products provided by different players in the ecosystem. Then there's a lack of data for credit models, which is something that Susan brought up earlier, and finally developing relevant products for that segment. When it comes to competitors, the good news is that we have a high level of acceptance for digitization in the region, which broadens the scope and brings down operational costs for banks. There is demand for digital payments, which means that e-payment is increasingly acceptable. And we have an exponential number of fintechs now, about 1,300 of them are currently seeking to operate in Latin America in order to compete on this market with a focus on financial inclusion. That's the good news. We also have new technologies such as artificial intelligence, which is making developing new models possible and increase the number of credit applications. In many cases, risk models that traditional banks have are mostly based on financial statements, meaning if the business doesn't report every movement, then banks cannot scale up the size of that business, they, and therefore they cannot offer credit. This is a real problem that we see today, and we need to look for alternate data, social data. We need to work with mass consumption companies to include this information in models. For example, using insights from Walmart on working capital for small businesses to include them financially or offer credit to these businesses using data. Using data is key, and that is why we need to promote initiatives that eliminate cash, that make e-payments more acceptable, and that digitize flows is important so that this can be used as data in business. So these are some ways we have been working, but where we need to make more progress is promoting the adoption and use. We need to bring costs down for MSMEs and Mobile devices need to be used. The added value must be relevant for SMEs. Market research shows that when someone decides on a new product or service, women have different needs than men do. They require more information. They ask many more questions than men do. Women don't simply assume that a financial product that is new or innovative will work for them. They truly value the opinions of their colleagues. So women also require finance, financial literacy services and business management services, mentoring services, for example, which we had already discussed. To, or they need access to networks of other women entrepreneurs. This means there is an ecosystem of different providers that can provide relevant products with added value. And in the end, the behavior pattern of purchasing and selling also changes and benefits this 
sector as well. Thank you very much, Kiki, for that. We have come to the end of the event. Thank you all for your contributions. Thanks for being such valuable partners for the IDB Group and Women in Latin America and the Caribbean. We know that if we strain the networks, add talent, and are willing to work, we will be able to achieve prosperity for our countries and our people. And as the name of the program says, Women Growing Together in the Americas is working together. And that is why we are so excited to work with Accenture, Facebook, MassCard, MC, Visa, and other companies that have joined the program to transform women-led and women-owned businesses in our region. We invite you to be a part of Women Growing Together in the Americas via Connect Americas dot com backslash women mujeres. Thank you very much for being with us today.